the people's president, my president, my husband, my best friend. You were born a peasant and died a president. Rest in power, August. I think it was one of the World Cups where he then came to me and he said to me, you know what, I don't have a TV at home. Conda come and watch World Cup at your house. And I had, a, I had a lovely house. I said, no, no problem. I didn't see it's a move. This is my, this is my buddy. <laughs> so you would come, you would come with his friends. So were you single at the time? I was single at the time. Okay. So you would come with his friends and I would make sure there's food. There was no problem. But after a while, I started to notice, hey, after half time, the friends are disappearing. <laughs> one by one, we always have things to do. <laughs> Absolutely, people are disappearing. But then we'd also start to talk. I think I talked to him about something. I, I confided in him about something. But that was personal. Yeah. And he gave me great advice. And I was like, hey, this guy. He's actually... But then he, you know, he's an interesting person. And women, we are so intuitive. We know when there's a vibe. Mm-hmm. So I started to call him uncle. Because mm-hmm. you know when you're trying to demotivate an older person, you call them uncle. Mm-hmm. Then he would send me a naughty text and he says, uncle. <laughs> uncle again. <laughs> so I realized that he doesn't care about this uncle uh-huh. story of mine. So you are not moved. And the more we spoke on a personal level, the more I realized, but this man is actually my soulmate. Late night discussions around the 2014 World Cup ultimately led to the nine years of marriage the couple enjoyed. I'm a very proud Namibian today. I'm proud because a boy who was born under a tree at a cattle post in Grootfontein is being recognized and loved by the world. And he deserves it. Because Hage loved, and he was loved. The outpouring of grief since his passing is a testament to how deeply he was loved. For us to be joined by so many dignitaries from all over the world, including so many presidents, all of whom he regarded as his friends, speaks to his ability to make enduring connections. Hage connected easily to people, and people from all walks of life connected easily to him. Hage, the internationalist, the Pan-African, the proud Namibian, the family man, the father to many, the joyful giver, the man who spoke of the Namibian house, a house where we pull together in the same direction, a house with a strong foundation. In mourning Hage, Namibia became everything he wanted us to be. United, law-abiding, and pulling in the same direction. In his death, Hage truly came alive. As he transitioned out of the limits set by his earthly body, we also transcended the political, racial, and ethnic boundaries we sometimes impose on ourselves. Hage was dedicated to building an inclusive united Namibia that lived up to its potential. He wanted the country's integration of cultures and the lack of tribalism he was raised in. He wanted to see the same integration and unity in his blended family. He may no longer be with us, but he did leave us with a map that has clear directions. Many told me this week that they felt lost, orphaned, fatherless. Some feel like they lost a baobab tree that shielded them from the sun, their protector, their defender, and mentor. I feel the same. I feel like I no longer have my anchor. I feel that if Hage died, what am I doing here? But the answer is in Hage's name. Hage means the one who arrived. Gottfried, as German-speaking people know, it means God's friend. President Pohamba, President Chisakedi, they loved calling him Gottfried. Gottfried means God's friend. And he loved to tell us that gay in Genkop stood for big and that nobody must ever try to reduce him. God's friend arrived on this earth on 3rd of August, 1941. He conquered the big things his surname required of him. And when his time was up, he left. Like he did 
It's up for us to define our purpose and live up to it before our time. God's will is not our will. Described as a destiny shaper by somebody who knew him well, he contributed significantly to shaping this country's destiny and that of many individuals. Hage had confidence and courage. He was always a leader. Another leadership experience he always narrates was how, on his way into exile, he had the privilege of meeting and being guided by the great Hosea Kutako, a meeting that he always spoke about as an immense privilege and which I suspect drove his desire to build a shrine to enhance the knowledge of current and future generations about the greatness of Hosea Kutako. Hage was not only a leader, but he was generous in recognizing the leadership of others. But I digress. We all heard his eulogy. Hage was always in a position of power, whether as a teacher, a young man, or a president much later in life. And with the full confidence of President Nyoma, Hage has wielded power for most of his life. For a powerful man, Hage was very humble. But like all powerful men, he was also very complex. But within his complexity was simplicity, authenticity, consistency, and vulnerability. This is what made him a people's person. He had a heart for people, and people had a heart for him. And I want to thank his brother, the President of the Republic of Namibia, for according him the hero's funeral that he deserves. I'd like to also thank all of you for giving him a send-off, the fitting of a hero. My husband was an honest man, a man who spoke his mind even when it was inconvenient and uncomfortable to do so. He's blunt when discussing third terms and leaders who overstay their welcome. In reflection, Hage and I were informed by doctors on 16 January 2024 that he had cancer after a biopsy. We went to our first oncology visit on the 17th of January to devise a treatment plan. And on 18 January, he, re he insisted on releasing a press statement notifying the public that he had cancer. Did he know how long he had to live? The answer is no, he didn't. His passing was traumatizing and unexpected. He was eager to retire. We had such plans. And true to his word, he didn't overstay. In the last few months, he spoke often about ensuring a smooth transition. And even though he left too early, the transition was smooth. It's just not the one that he expected. The country saw in a new president on the same day he passed, and there was no power struggle. We should be proud of ourselves and our political leadership. If there was a display of political maturity, it was in that moment, and long may it continue. Many people can tell you where and what they were doing when they heard that Hage Genkop was no more. I'll tell you where I was. I was at his side, shocked to the deepest part of my core that someone so full of life, so full of love, had just taken his last breath. Death will humble you. It's been raining since Hage passed away. Yesterday, when his coffin was outside, Casa Rosalia, which is our private residence, the sun appeared briefly from behind the clouds and shone straight on his coffin. When I walked back into Casa Rosalia and sat down, the clouds had returned and there was a rainbow. These things do not happen by coincidence. That's the Lord telling us we lost a great man. I was not ready to lose again. And from the massive outpouring of collective grief from all of you, it does not appear that any of us were ready. Hagia wore his heart on his sleeve, and in response, this country wept. The scenes we saw yesterday were heartbreaking and heartwarming in equal measure. A nation united in grief, but celebrating their departed president. Hagia's transparency has helped us in more ways than one. And because he spoke to us so often about his preferences regarding his legacy and expectations from us as his immediate family, it was easy to reach a consensus on key decisions. A dull ache settled into my stomach, and it has remained there to date. Grief unleashes anarchy in your system, as your mind, emotions, and body simply do as they please, when they please. One minute you're walking and talking, and the next moment you are gasping for air as a wave of intense sadness washes over you. 
When you lose someone you, we love, we lose a piece of ourselves. And the closer you are, the bigger that piece. And Hage gave so much of himself that we all had a piece of him. When I got back from the morgue that morning, I walked into the house for the first time as a widow, and the abbess immediately tried to swallow me. And there's a duality to love and grief. Love is replaced by grief, and grief is replaced by love. We mourn because we loved. Hage's ordeal put me in the front row of the devastating impact of cancer. All of the doctors I interacted with are concerned about the rising cases of cancer in Namibia and what appears to be a global phenomenon. A few mentioned that they were pleased to see an increase in men looking to be screened for cancer once the president announced that he had cancer. The WHO recently announced a frightening projection of a rise of 77% in cancer cases by the year 2050. If anyone is watching megatrends in public health care, cancer care, particularly the inequities that define it, should be a priority focus area. It certainly will be for me. I want to thank all the healthcare workers who helped us during this difficult period. Everyone went over and above the call of duty and to the staff in the presidency. Even though Hage has left us, the legacy continues. Oh, Hageba, ke Achba. You defined love. You are loved by all of us, and nothing will ever be the same without you. Thank you. But no one feels left out of the Namibian house. But these words, on the eve of the year 2024, the year of expectations, the year of elections, it will be a new beginning for the Namibian house. Therefore, I extend my best wishes for the new year to 